Good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices. We have not received any apologies, although Gavin Brown is, is not yet here. Hopefully he will turn up um, soon. Um, our first item of business this morning is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16. The session will focus on outcomes and performance budgeting. I would like to welcome to the meeting uh, Colin Mayer of the Improvement Service, uh, Gareth Davis of SEPFA and Fraser McKinley of Audit Scotland. Uh, members have copies of the written submissions received in advance of today's meeting, so we will move straight to questions from the committee. And uh, Gavin has just joined us. Um, now, I, I, as you probably uh, know, I, I usually start off with a few questions and then open out the session to colleagues uh, around the table. So that's what I propose to do on this occasion. So thank you very much uh, for the submissions. And Colin, we'll start with uh, with you actually. Um, and Annex B, uh, well, it's Annex B that, that we have. It's um, under your um, section two, profusion and prolixity. <laughs> Not a word that comes up very <laughs> often. <laughs> Uh, under uh, 2.1, you say, um, bluntly, there's a huge amount of it in terms of, um, you know, the, the different kind of uh, frameworks to support or, or, or look at uh, outcomes, and you say, but we never seem to have proceeded by accretion without deletion. And you go in, therefore, to say that your focus on outcomes seems often to have been retrofitted to service or sectoral performance frameworks. And I, I sense, actually... Um, an element of frustration there, Colin, you know, that you feel as if, you know, the more and more people are coming up with ideas about how we look at outcomes, but it never seems to be kind of rationalised into something which can be delivered uh, more effectively. And you go on in the next paragraph to say, it's often unclear who the end user of such frameworks is intended to be, i.e. who they're for and what they are for. So I just wonder if you can expand on, on, on your thoughts on this uh, for the committee. Yeah, uh, thanks very much indeed uh, for the, the question. I suppose... Our sense reviewing all of the performance frameworks we can identify at national level in Scotland, we then move on to identify all the local ones and we'll pull all of that together into a final report looking at what we're doing around performance. Uh, I'd appended two or three overhead shots to my submission, just summarising some of the mapping work we've been doing. And as you'll see, there is a staggering amount going on, a huge number of overlapping performance frameworks. I think, for me, this was less a critique of anybody uh, and more that frameworks have evolved at different points in time for different purposes, uh, and then we add a new purpose on and fit something else to them. Uh, the most recent arrival in the scene, I think, has been an outcome focus, but I think we've often posed the question the wrong way round. Uh, we've said of services, what are our outcomes, as opposed to saying what outcomes do we want for the Scottish population and how does this service contribute to that. Uh, so we've begun to create silos around outcomes, uh, even though the whole idea of an outcome focus was to help us break out of the silos we started from. I think two points I would make. Clearly, a lot of any performance framework in a major public service will be those indicators you need to run that public service well. And there's clearly a lot of both political and public interest in just basically running public services competently and well. Are we meeting service standards we've committed to? Are we using the resources available as efficiently as we could? And an awful lot of the performance uh, armoury we have is focused at that level. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Public services are massive businesses. They need run competently as massive businesses. Uh, I guess our sense is, out of all the audiences for performance measurement, the one that wants a holistic overview, as you seem to do in this committee just now, is probably still the weakest voice. The sectoral or service voice remains much, much stronger, and the business management voice remains very strong indeed in the way we go about performance measurement and management. And I suspect even at a parliamentary level, whereas the Finance Committee may want an integrated and holistic view of outcomes, other committees of Parliament will be distinctively interested in particular indicators relating to health, particular indicators relating to education and children. So in a way, at the same time as we all want to come together, we all want to look down particular lines of sight as well. And I think what you get there for in performance management is a kind of compromise between those things. Just a final point in response to your question. Uh, the Community Empowerment and Renewal Bill, which is being scrutinised elsewhere uh, just now in Parliament, will 
will place a common duty on public bodies to work together to improve outcomes. Once that duty is in place in law, I think it will put some dynamic behind getting to a collective view of what outcomes are we trying to improve and what measures are we going to use to show that we have actually improved those outcomes. So as I say, I think I wasn't intending Section 1 as a critique particularly. Uh, it's simply an honest recognition of where we are, uh, that the business management interest remains a very powerful one around public services, and properly so. Uh, and those who want an holistic view of what are we achieving overall for the Scottish population are probably not the strongest voice, frankly. In so performance you, management at the present moment. Colin, you're going to say in, in paragraph three that outcomes are often defined in service terms, as you've just kind of yep. touched on, rather than independently in terms of the life chances, life outcomes, and quality of life of people and communities. So you think it's a kind of can't see the wood for the trees kind of approach sometimes in terms of outcomes? Well, I think it's a very natural service orientation if you're running, say, a health and social care partnership. It's very tempting to say what outcomes are ours and we will then build them into our performance framework separate from everybody else, uh, and we will operate to that. The trouble is health and care outcomes are massively influenced by a very wide range of social and economic factors. They are not solely influenced by the organisation of health and care services, and therefore we begin to try and narrow the thing down, rather than, if we're serious, this is about improving life for people in Scotland, and particularly those who are suffering the greatest inequalities in Scotland, uh, then we need a much better integrated overall focus. Community planning is in part supposed to provide that. I think we've not quite got to the point where the collective discipline community planning could bring uh, is fully being brought to bear. Uh, Audit Scotland have done really interesting audits, as you'll know, of community planning partnerships. And one of the issues is how do you pull it all together against a simple set of outcomes for the local population and then show that we're moving forward to achieve that? Do other witnesses wish to comment on this particular issue? Uh, just briefly, Sorry. convener, thank you. I, I agree with um, everything that Colin has said. I think uh, our view in Audit Scotland is the outcomes approach is a good thing and we shouldn't lose sight of that. It's difficult to imagine a world now without it. I think it has become, uh, certainly at the kind of most senior levels in the public sector in Scotland, the, the way that public services are talked about and, and viewed. I think our observation from all of the audit work we've done in community planning and policy areas and individual bodies is that the, the national performance framework and, and everything that's set out around that is the tip of an iceberg and the rest of the iceberg isn't quite in place to support um, that outcomes-based approach. And, and in particular, obviously, we have a, a, a very close interest in the money. Uh, Colin mentioned the audit work we're doing around community planning partnerships and the Commission, the Accounts Commission in order to general will be publishing another national community planning report uh, later this year. And they are still, community planning partnerships are still at very early stages of figuring out how they use their combined money, people, assets to um, progress and to deliver better outcomes for the communities. I think that's still, uh, if, if I was to pick one single thing, I think that's the single thing that is still uh, needing to be really pushed forward and, and we need to crack if we're really going to make a, a, a real difference to this whole outcomes-based approach. Yes. Uh, well, I would certainly echo and agree with uh, the, the comments made so far. Um, from my uh, perspective and understanding, really, you know, uh, outcomes to me are a consequence or result of action, or in some cases, arguably, inaction. And I think um, I would tend to put it in the framework of governance, particularly the international framework for good governance in the public sector, actually has one of its key principles as defining outcomes in terms of sustainable economic, social and environmental benefits. So to my mind, an outcomes-focused organisation should be doing outcome uh, budgeting in that sense. So outcome budgeting could be seen as basically evidence that there is an outcomes focus for your organisation. So I would tend to tie this to a large extent into the actual overall governance of an organisation or of public money generally. Um, so, But yes, I agree totally with what was said earlier, that it is a holistic impact uh, on society as a whole which matters. And the, the final bit I'd point uh, out there as well is that uh, outcomes don't just affect the individuals or service recipients. It's maybe an awareness on the part of the organisation of the consequence of its actions on all stakeholders, whether that's other parts of the public sector, third party suppliers, such as voluntary sector, uh, or indeed employees. And it's an awareness of the consequence of the actions as a whole and how they reverberate out uh, through society, really. 
I mean, Fraser, in, 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 in your Scotland's paper, you know, in paragraph 7, you say that there, there is scope for the Scottish Government to demonstrate a more systemic, systematic approach to implementing the outcomes approach. Can you can you expand it? I mean, you, you go on and uh, talk about modern apprenticeships. So I just wonder if you can expand a wee bit more on how you feel that can be uh, delivered. Yes, yeah, sure, Convener. Um, I think the, the, the example of modern apprenticeships is a good one because I think it's where we see some tensions between... Um, when a policy is set out, and particularly in terms of outcomes around the national performance framework, it is very outcome focused. I think then the challenge is once we get into the nitty gritty of the measurement of the delivery of those outcomes, a lot of the indicators that are used are not outcome based. So we use the modern apprenticeships one as, as an example because the headline target is um, 25,000 new modern apprenticeships. Now that's a good thing. We're not saying that's a wrong thing. We're not even saying that that shouldn't be a target or an objective, but what it doesn't do is measure the outcome of what those 25,000 new modern apprentices are going to do for uh, their communities and for the economy as a whole. So we see a kind of disconnect uh, there and indeed in other places where um, we grapple with an overall outcomes-based approach, which tends to be longer term, ten tends to be a bit more diffuse, tends to be, if, if we're honest, a bit more difficult to explain in political terms. Uh, with um, targets that tend to talk about uh, numbers of things, whether that's new, whether that's teachers or police officers or whatever it is, and there's a real kind of tension there, I think, between the outcomes-based approach and then the kind of measurement and performance information and the whole, as Gareth says, that whole system of performance management and performance information that is then designed to support it. We, as you can imagine, convener have. Uh, constructive and robust uh, discussions with Scottish Government as we go through our uh, audit process and, and uh, we come from quite a simple place really which is if you've got and I, I can think of some policy areas like self-directed support or reshaping care for older people reports we've published recently which are kind of longish term 10 years plus uh, policy outcomes and we were looking at these re relatively early on kind of three years in uh, and we got a bit of challenge back from Scottish Government about that uh, about the fact that we're looking at it too early. But our question is a simple one, which is how do you know? How do you know in a, in a long-term outcomes-based approach that you're making the right progress and the things you're doing and the money you're spending is actually making the difference you need it to do? And I think, uh, in, in summary, convener, I think that's where we would see the, the focus needing now to, to really make, make real and make more meaningful the outcomes-based approach on a kind of, um, in a very practical sense. Colin, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would, I would endorse what Fraser said. I think we're often stuck with measures, even when they look like outcome measures. I mean, I think we've alluded in our submission to how we measure children's educational attainment and therefore inequalities in educational attainment, which is S4 and S5 tariff score. These were scoring systems produced by UCAS, the university admission people. So they're an utterly selective understanding of educational achievement and accomplishment. They're what salient to a university and not what isn't. For that reason, they don't include vocational qualifications, even though government and parliament have recently committed very strongly to massively strengthening and valuing up vocational qualifications in Scotland. Uh, and yet we are still measuring, in essence, what used to be standard grades in four fives, uh, and then hires and advanced hires. And we're saying that's how you measure the achievement of children. But many children leave school after the fourth year, go to a college, do a vacation. It just vanishes off the face of the earth as part of our assessment of educational outcomes. We've then got a positive destinations outcome, uh, which more or less means you're not in prison, you're not detained under mental health legislation, uh, and you're not unemployed. So you could be in a zero hours contract. Is that the positive destination we sought for children through the education system? So an awful lot of our measures are at the very best proxy measures uh, that are not actually telling us. What I would say is I think a lot of our concern about educational attainment is frankly uh, inequalities in education is because of how we measure it. We don't measure things. The kids we're worried about suffering inequalities gap tend to do and measure only those things uh, that tend to suit the more academic stream of children within the system. So your view basically is if you're not m measuring it effectively, you're not going to be targeting that specific area in order to achieve the outcomes that society would want or, to or, see. Or worse than the kind of cynical view that what's measured is what matters, that people become driven mm -hmm. by the particular measure we are 
using just now. Uh, I mean, and we're not, we lose sight of the outcome because these targets now exist. We want to show our school or our council is doing well in those targets. So a big drive goes on behind that. Whether that's the right thing for children, the right thing for the future economy, the right thing for their communities and society, it's probably a different proposition. So I guess I would support what well, phrasing one of our one of the challenges I think is to work back from policy and say, well, what outcome is it we're achieving? And that's the whole range of outcomes that Gareth uh, alluded to. And are we using our total resource intelligently to enable us to achieve that outcome, whether that's a local partnership or whether that's government itself taking the overview at national level? Gareth? Well, again, uh, you know, uh, no disagreement from me. Uh, I'm maybe going to allude to something that was in uh, Audit Scotland's written evidence. Uh, it might be too early to mention logic map. I think that that's a key part of, uh, of what we're talking about here because what we're really trying to establish to a certain extent is how your output targets, if you like, contribute towards the outcomes. And uh, logic mapping would help you to build that. More importantly, I think, uh, you know, is the evidence or assumptions underlining that because if somebody produces a logic map then you can start to say what evidence or assumptions are supporting the relationships between the achievement of your output and the actual outcome that you want to see more to the point as Fraser said you know the the earlier you are aware of whether or not that is succeeding the better and then you can rearrange your resources or, or your activities to actually try and achieve your outcomes better because it might turn out that you could spend a lot of time going down the road towards an output that you set a long time ago which is no longer going to be relevant or no longer going to actually help you produce the outcome you want. So I think being able to uh, look at the evidence and assumptions that underlie the logic of, uh, of the output measures is a key thing. Okay, Gareth, uh, just on this particular issue, I'll go, go, to, go to you first this time. Um, uh, Audit Scotland, under uh, paragraph 13 of its uh, of, um, uh, of Fraser's mission, it says here, as a subsection, it says the Scottish Government should map the pathways that connect each portfolio's contribution to the national outcomes, which is the kind of issue you're just touching on. But what, what could, should we do less of in terms of this? Because Colin, in his submission, touched on you know the fact that that you know there is a cre accretion but not deletion. So wh wh what do you think we can, in terms of outcomes uh, measurement, to get much more effective assessment of outcomes uh, by removing some which perhaps are, are not as effective? I think the way to identify what is effective is to challenge or question what the evidence is for that output in the first place. You know, that's the the where I would probably start going would be to start looking at, you know, what are the different outputs that people have. In terms of, um, you, you know, psych steps towards things, I mean, I, I suspect that most people, uh, you know, here would probably accept that this is not going to be up, we will solve everything overnight, and there might be steps towards it. One thing that obviously the committee picked up on earlier, and uh, I think Audit Scotland referenced as well, was use of incremental budgeting. And certainly, to be honest, that doesn't really tend to lend itself in many respects uh, in a changing environment towards a challenge or rethink about where the resources are going to some extent. So I think maybe uh, looking at the budget process from the point of view of what's the actual underlying assumption of the budget model you're using, is it incremental budgeting or should we move to priority-based budgeting? You know, in an era of change and financial pressure, then maybe, you know, it's like moving towards priority-based or zero-based budgeting, you know, is, is where we should go. Uh, one example of that would be Shetland Islands Council. Uh, they have significantly uh, looked at and reviewed their operations to decide whether they are reflecting the actual priorities with their budget. And they've gone through a zero-based budgeting exercise to actually basically uh, restate, you know, where, where they want their resources to go. Well, on, on that, Fraser, I mean, is there much sharing of best practice in terms of uh, outcomes uh, across Scotland? Not, I guess not as much as we would like, uh, convener. Um, we did a report um, a wee while back around... Uh, just earlier this year, in fact, on developing financial reporting, which looked at some of this. We, we touched on issues of priority-based budgeting or zero-based uh, budgeting, and there are some places that do that. Aberdeen's another example that have been doing that uh, for, for quite a while. Um, and there have been quite a lot of activity, and Colin could say a little bit more about some of the work that the Improvement Service and others have been in looking at outcome budgeting in particular. And I think the thing to say is it's really difficult. I mean, this is not an easy thing to do. If it was an easy thing to do, we would have done it a long time ago. And it's difficult in very practical sense. If you take something like money spent on housing, 
Um, housing is one of those things that touches on virtually every other outcome that there is. Good quality housing is absolutely fundamental. Everyone recognises absolutely fundamental to good health, good uh, employment opportunities and everything else that goes with it in terms of um, uh, managing inequality and other things. So how do you attribute the spend on housing to the other however many outcomes that you're trying to achieve. This is not a straightforward exercise. And um, and I think there is always going to be a tension, an inherent tension from um, the likes of me in Audit Scotland who will continue to be interested in the, the money that individual organisations have to spend being spent well and properly and efficiently. Uh, and I make no apology for that. So how do you kind of... Um, resolve that view of the world with a view of the world that has to be much more about aligning resource and, and thinking about how resources are being directed towards um, budgets. So um, I think our, our sense convener is to, to be hopeful about it is that people I think are really, particularly through the community planning work, are now really grappling with issue in a way that I don't really think we've seen until uh, the last couple of years, the letter that um, Mr Swinney and Mr Neil and the President of COSLA and the Chair of the National Community Planning Group sent a year ago, Colin, um, setting out very clearly, I think, the expectations around community planning partnerships in terms of their use of resources and, and thinking about the use of the totality of the resource available to those public sector partners has really galvanised action and we can see lots of activity um, uh, out there as people try to get their heads around this. But it is, it is really tricky. It's tough. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to let Colin in, but after uh, Colin's spoken, I'll open out the session to uh, colleagues around the table. Colin? But I was just to pick up on uh, a latter point Fraser made, I think this is about the use of resources, not just budgets. I think where people have sought to share every single budget line with each other, the net effect has been a staggering amount of time has been taken up. Not very much light has been generated, even of a fair amount of heat. And we need to be honest, we are going to continue to run core, large-scale, expensive public assets and services. So in local government, about 50% of the budget is education. And of that, about 47% is going directly to run schools. So you're talking about a huge proportion of the total budgetary resource goes straight into the school system. Uh, understandably, the public are deeply concerned that schools are maintained the school in their area, are of quality, have the right teaching, staff compliments and so on. So the question may not be, are we going to take budget away from the school and do something else with it? It might be, are we going to use the resources the school constitutes in different ways with local communities so we get more value towards outcomes <coughs> out of what we do? So at, just at this stage in the discussion, I think if we go straight into budgets, which has often seen to be uh, the numbers around financial flows and so on, the most spectacular achievements I see, we work with a number of neighbourhood projects, neighbourhood community planning projects across Scotland. Are people just using resources in imaginative and creative and flexible ways with each other at very local levels? They're getting on with it with a community to do things differently for that community and with that community. There's probably no change to the formal budgets of these organisations. It's just people using resources in a smarter way. And I guess my final point is one of the biggest resources the public service has in Scotland is it uh, employs about 25% of the total labour force. It is overwhelmingly the major procurer of goods and services within the Scottish economy, and it has the largest asset base. So there's an interesting question. If you have those capacities, are you using those to create the outcomes you say you want? We're often putting community benefit clauses into procurements, saying we want you to create modern apprenticeships, employ people from deprived days and so on. It's worth saying, well, does the health board that's putting that clause in actually do that itself or not? Does it employ people from very deprived areas within its community? Uh, if not, why is that? And are they intending to address that as part of how they go forward? Because what we do know is communities having better economic opportunities is a significant step towards those communities also having better health, their children achieving better in the education system, and so on. So I would encourage you to think about resources and not just finances here, albeit your role is to scrutinise the Scottish budget. Although you did say when talking about public <coughs> services, you know, in uh, paragraph 8, that examining both international and Scottish data, we can find no systemic evidence that the organisation and quality of public services is a key or main determinant of the pattern of outcomes in any society. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, there is no question that the pattern of economic outcomes 
uh, is driven more directly by macroeconomic and fiscal strategy than it's driven by how you organise your local public services. Uh, and that, I think, if you look at the whole range of literature, is reinforced by research as a conclusion. So it's not to say public services can't have an impact. I think they can and they should have more of an impact in creating opportunities for people who currently lack them. Uh, a very good example, the new Scottish Police Service is about to locate uh, its new headquarters in Dunmarnock and Glasgow in the Clyde Gateway. The fact that the police have been willing to do that has now opened up a site that will become hyperactive with other private investors coming in, uh, precisely because the police constitutes an anchor. Once some big public body shows confidence in this place, the private sector start to show confidence in the back of it. Now, I think that's just a really intelligent use of the capacity of the Scottish Police. They need a headquarters. Where are you going to base it? Answer, pick an area of deprivation for once, rather than an area in the more pucker parts of town. Uh, and then create an economy around your headquarters, because cafes, shops and so on grow up to service the office workers coming in. If that then gives confidence to the private sector in the place, you start to have incredibly positive investment flows into a part of Glasgow that was frankly being written down 20 years ago as going nowhere at all. It was just contaminated land. So I do think how we use our asset power is a really important part of how we stimulate economies to give people opportunities that will then support their health and well-being within their communities. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, now in terms of winding out the session, the first person to ask questions will be Jamie, to followed by Jean. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. It's just uh, a couple of questions. The first uh, relates to uh, Mr McKinley's uh, uh, paper, and in your paper you say that there is evidence of greater focus on outcomes uh, both nationally and locally, and uh, earlier in your paper you specifically say that your audit work has demonstrated the impact of the National Performance Framework in aligning resources and action, area, uh, action across different parts of the public sector and some policy areas. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about that and cite these positive, positive examples and if Mr Davis and Mr Mayor want to comment on it as well that would be useful. Sure, um, so as I said right at the start the national performance framework, the outcome approach is a good thing and it's a really important first step and, and it is I think embedded in, in many ways in, in how public services are thought about and run particularly at the most senior levels. Um, I think we mentioned in, in the submission one of the good examples was renewable energy. We did a report on that a year or so ago, and it was very clear evidence that um, if you were to look at the overall policy objective right through to how all the different organisations involved in renewable energy had reflected that policy objective and the outcomes that were trying to be delivered was a very good example of how um, that uh, clarity and consistency of approach could be seen right the way right the way through the piece. Um, so I think that, that that's the, one of the examples we've, we've cited there. Locally, um, if I think of some of the recent community planning reports we've done, places like Glasgow, um, we reported on the way in which Glasgow have coalesced their community planning partnership around uh, three priorities, um, which I'm not going to remember right now, but one of which was <laughs> uh, there was alcohol, uh, in-work poverty and something else which escapes me just now. Um, which is a real achievement because that's not to say that they're ignoring everything else. Clearly, everything else that the Community Planning Partnership and Public Services in the City of Glasgow are having to deal with it remain important. But what they'd said was, um, based on an understanding of the communities of Glasgow, based on an understanding of the data of the different communities, and they also had a, a, an interesting approach to tackling different um, things in different parts of the city as well, recognising that Glasgow's not just one homogenous place. Um, they had got themselves around the table and they had agreed that these three things were the three things that were most likely to make the biggest impact in terms of inequality and outcomes in the city. Now, there's an awful long way to go uh, in terms of them actually making that making that deliverable and making the difference there. But in terms of an approach where we say there's good examples locally of an outcomes approach, that would be one, and it's by no means the only one. The missing bits of the jigsaw now are all the supporting bits with that to do with the money. So they're at the early stages of, as all community planning partnerships are, figuring out how they actually then target the combined resource in Glasgow to those priorities and how they're spending 
uh, their collective um, money and how they're using their buildings and how they're using their people to achieve those uh, outcomes um, and all the kind of performance management and to pick up Gareth's like, good point earlier about governance, how the, how the partnership is governing all of that, there's still a very long way to go. Um, but I guess that's what we mean that um, it, it feels like, and, and when we did the last National Community Planning Report, which is now getting on from maybe 18 months, two years ago, we talked about um, a kind of an opportunity to deliver a step change, that there was a real sense that um, people were genuinely committing uh, to this approach. And, and I think the, the, the real challenge now is to put in the, the infrastructure to support it. From what you're saying, it seems to me what you're saying there, the prior, prioritisation of outcomes is important. This might relate to Mr Mayor's point, you know, the proliferation of too many yeah. outcomes is, is maybe a bad thing and you have to be really quite focused if you're going to take forward an outcomes-based approach. Well, that's it's a really interesting question, that, because another one we're doing, uh, we had at the Kent's Commission last week, was West Lothian. Uh, CPP, long established, good history, as you'll know, of, of, of very strong partnership working, really great examples of co-location of public services and other things. And actually, they're taking a different view. They are taking quite a broad um, front uh, in terms of outcomes. They haven't narrowed down on, on, on two or three key priorities. And we've, you know, we've highlighted a, a challenge to them or a risk to them that while that's entirely up to them to decide to do it that way, they do need to figure out how they're going to use their scarce resource to, to make progress on, on a wide range of fronts. So I don't think I would... I'm a wee bit cautious to say one model's better than the other model. I think what's important is that people have a model and they have a plan for uh, how they're going to implement those and, and, and in particular they understand how they're going to organise themselves and their people and their building and their money uh, to, to deliver the outcomes they've set for themselves. I don't know Mr Mayor or, or Mr Davies have a perspective. I, oh, uh, I will be uh, very brief just to say uh, I think I would agree with, uh, with, with what's been said. Um, to my mind a uh, key thing about this is the role of CPPs in locality and uh, that means locality um, or, or total place uh, or community budgeting it's sometimes referred to which is basically being able to say how much public service money is being spent in a particular place and as Colin said it doesn't stop at the pound signs that's actually the resources that are being used and are they being used to best effect and I think that also takes you in to where the CPPs there should be a duty of best value for an area you know in terms of you know saying these are the resources in the area are we getting the best for the area it also very clearly comes back to what Fraser was saying which is how well attuned is any CPP or equivalent uh, body really to the needs of the area and uh, and that engagement is a key thing and I know that uh, the improvement service have just done some on engagement yeah uh, I mean my sense is that three really positive things are happening at local level one is most of the community planning partnerships in Scotland have got to a, a smaller number of outcomes they're seeing a priority and massively fewer performance indicators. You know, if we are about, in the words of the statement of ambition of last year, demonstrably improving lives, let's have half a dozen indicators that tell us whether people's lives are moving on or they're not. I think the second thing that's happened is there is now more targeting. There's a recognition that some of our communities are living very good lives, have excellent outcomes, they are largely self-sustaining around those outcomes. They use public services when they want to, but they're in no sense dependent of them. There are other communities who have a far higher need for properly organised, responsive public services. So I think there is now more of a focus in saying, let's identify communities where, across a whole range of outcomes, people are not doing well, and let's commit to helping those communities move on by working with them in new, more flexible and different ways. Uh, and there's often measurement around that. That's the total place approach uh, that Gareth uh, was referring to. Um, and I think the third thing is we've kind of not quite stop, but almost stop using the national performance framework as cake icing. Whatever it is you propose to do, just slap a dod of national performance framework on it. And uh, there was a kind of cynical referencing went on a lot of the time with the national performance. I mean, looking at some papers that go up to Parliament, the amount of references from the civil service to the national performance framework is now liturgical rather than real, I suspect, uh, that you've got to say this kind of thing. I think we need to move away from that and actually focus on outcomes we are truly committed to and truly intend to change. But I think that localism that both Fraser and Gareth emphasised is really important here because it's when you get down to the level of community and engaging with communities in different ways, you begin to see new routes to achieving outcomes, you begin to see new capacities communities can bring to the table. And that's part of the resourcing question as to how we take outcomes forward.
I mean, you've all mentioned there, you've talked about community partnerships, and you've talked about localism and, and engagement. I mean, what, surely these outcomes will only mean something for people if they, they feel they're relevant to them. So how involved do you think, particularly at a community level, how involved do you think people on the ground are in terms of saying, well, these are the outcomes we'd like to see for, for our community, for, for us, for our children, and, and for everyone who lives in this area? More so, I think the interesting relationship is between engagement and empowerment. How empowered are some of these communities to drive forward and force people to prioritise the outcomes that they see as important for their communities? So I think engagement has got a huge amount better. There is a, a lot of time, effort and energy spent at a local level to engage with communities. I was through in an all-day event with a neighbourhood in Fife yesterday. Uh, and there was a lot of effort at the energy and that, and the community was fantastically active and constructive in its engagement around what, what were outcome priorities for their local area. Not for the whole of Fife, but for their local area in Fife. And I think it's that localism combined with the willingness to be open in engagement that makes the difference. If you ask people in a bit of Kirkcaldy, what do you think about the whole of Fife? Perfectly reasonably, not a lot. Uh, they're interested in what happens in their bit of Kirkcaldy, quite frankly, and quite rightly so. So in that sense, localism allows people to engage more, I think. The more you ask big abstract questions, you know, the classic old-fashioned budget consultation, we've got to save 20 million, here are 86 options, tick them. That isn't engagement at all, I don't think. That is a tick-the-box exercise. I think as we get down and much more local with communities, we're getting a far higher quality of engagement now than we were in the past. Uh, I think that, yes, engagement obviously is an issue uh, or, or uh, a prime uh, topic at the moment because I was at an event yesterday which was about tenant participation with the HRA uh, and some of the ideas coming across with that uh, were very interesting. In particular, what was being emphasised really was that uh, it's a head-to-toe, uh, you know, for an organisation. It, it should be a head-to-toe culture for engagement. Uh, you don't just need formal panels or whatever. Frontline service delivery staff are obviously the first, uh, are normally the first people to get feedback from people uh, about how happy they are, what, what their aspirations are, as you were saying. And uh, it's a question of how does that information flow through the organisation and then actually lead into service delivery and service planning decisions. So, you know, a large part of client engagement can actually come from the front. And there again, you come down to, to a certain extent, what is the governance or what is the culture of the organisation that you've got? Uh, one final question for me. Uh, you know, um, you, you'll probably be all aware, and it follows on, we're talking about uh, community engagement. The, the Scottish Government has a community empowerment uh, bill, and one of the things that it, it talks about is placing a duty on uh, ministers to publish and report regularly on the progress of national outcomes uh, for Scotland. Do, do, do you welcome this? Do you think this is something that, that should happen? Do you think it will actually be a, a positive thing? I think it, it will be positive. I think we have a national performance framework just now, but it's not used as national performance management. So I've noted in my piece we want to be fairer, but I have no idea how much fairer we want to be and by when. Uh, and therefore, from the point of view of driving the system, uh, it may be more interesting if national government is clearer about its level of ambition, the timescales and its expectations as to how the public service should deliver in Scotland, because I think that would provide... Uh, a degree of dynamic within the system. Just now, we have a framework of outcomes. We will be fairer, smarter, and so on over time. Well, if we said by 220, how much smarter would you like us to be? That might be a kind of helpful feed into the system. Uh, and that can then be linked down to local level uh, as well. So I, w I will welcome it, but I think it may need some tweaking of the framework itself and some focusing of it uh, to make that useful, frankly. The, the, the principle of having uh, enshrining the outcomes approach in, in legislation, I think, is a good one. And, and from our point of view, as you would expect, we are very interested in how that's going to work. What's the governance around that? What are the accountability arrangements around that? If people aren't seen to be fulfilling that duty in terms of outcomes, um, what happens if, if you know, ministers of any government in the future um, set out with a whole bunch of input targets and measures and not outcome measures. What does that mean? I think there's a whole one of the one of the questions we raised in in the last community planning national report is that sense of what is the accountability framework for partnership and community planning um, in Scotland. Um, it, we're kind of in between a couple of stools at the moment. I think where we're kind of saying yes, there are national outcomes. It's a national approach, but it's all about place. And, um, and there's a real tension inherent in that that I don't think we've actually quite 
bottomed out. So um, I think it's a it's a, a, a good and useful step, and we'll be very interested to see how it actually plays out in practice. Yeah, I, I think one thing that uh, also bears relation to, to planning going forward as well is uh, the spending review periods. Uh, you know that uh, that Treasury tend to set. Uh, it does create a challenge for organisations, uh, you know, if they're not sure or there's a lot of uncertainty about funding going forwards and, uh, you know, th they maybe are trying to think five to ten years ahead. I don't think in the best of worlds that, you know, there'll ever be certainty about funding. So I think to some extent there is going to be in a sense of encouragement to actually plan for the medium and long term through that uncertainty rather than say, the, you know, the uncertainty prevents you from doing anything. And I think there is an importance on, on service planning for that. Uh, you know, to achieve outcomes, because otherwise it's probably always going to be a year-on-year -year basis to, to a certain extent. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Jean, to follow by John. <laughs> thank you, convener. I wanted just to, to ask about the National Performance Framework. We, in, in roundtable discussions that we've had here with economists, they cited it as a, 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 a really a progressive development and that it was being recognised internationally as something uh, to be revered. And I, I wonder uh, if, if you concur with that view, if you see it as a, a kind of really progressive and groundbreaking and for whom? Bye. Go <laughs> first <with> that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing a bit of a drum roll here as I, as I answer this question, but uh, yes, I mean, I, it's, I think it's interesting that the Scottish model of government is now a phrase, isn't it? And, and people recognise it and people welcome it. And I think it will be really interesting to see what happens at the next Hollywood elections as to whether the approach in broad terms is embedded almost regardless of who the government of the day is, because as I said earlier, it feels like it has become uh, embedded. And, and to be fair, even before 2007, the whole notion of outcomes and um, single outcome agreements and all that had had been around, so it's not it's not an, an approach that's I think uniquely tied to any one um, government or any one political party. And there and there is lots of international interest and research being done around it. So yes, I, I would concur that it's it's a very good and progressive model, and it's difficult to see how you could ever go back to uh, a model that isn't outcomes based. And as I've said already, I think there's an awful long way to go to to realise the potential of that framework. I mean we. We get quite a lot of um, pushback in the work we do uh, because, you know, obviously our job is to hold uh, government uh, primarily to account uh, in terms of how they're doing these things. And quite often in committee or in other places they say, but this is all really difficult, you know, and we say, well, yeah, we know it is. But, but this is the, what you've decided to do. I think having started down this path of outcomes uh, and an outcomes approach to delivering public services, you need to continue down that down that path all the way to making sure that what's happening within individual organisations and on and in places and in towns all makes sense and all stacks up to deliver that outcomes approach. It's not enough just to have the national performance framework in Scotland performs as good as that is. We really need the infrastructure in how public services are run day to day, um, including uh, resources and budgeting, to really make it to really make it fly. I think would be my sense of it. Just add one point, I think one of the models for Scotland performs were models being adopted by American states, Virginia performs being an underlying model for the Scottish system. What's interesting in the states is they don't take Virginia performs as a measure of the performance of the Virginian state government. They take it quite literally, because they're sceptical about governments doing anything for the economy or anything else in America, uh, so they're simply saying, this is how well Virginia is doing. Uh, and it's often pitched to international inward investors and so on. So they're saying, look, this is the kind of place you might like to be because we're not very unequal, our health's fairly decent, our kids are well educated, our labour market's flexible, uh, whatever. Now, what the indicators are not there for taking to be measures of the performance of public services, they're simply saying, this is how this place is doing. Uh, now, at one level, I think that might be a running checklist you would definitely want about Scotland. How is the place doing? And if it's not doing well in areas we would wish we were doing well, the public services then have to think, well, how can they contribute more and better to making it the way we'd like the place to be? But I think there's a genuine tension runs through much of the discussion of outcomes, which is 
either they're simply statements about the world of our country, our society, our economy, and so on, and that's fine, we should have such statements and they should be accurately measured. Uh, but it's not a judgment of any sort on the performance of public services. And I think uh, the most recent PISA data, for example, which was reported to Parliament on kids' educational performance in Scotland in comparison to other OECD countries, one of the points they made was that the variation in Scotland is disproportionately within a single school rather than between schools. Whereas in other countries, if there are inequalities of achievement, there's one school doing really well systematic and another school doing really badly. In Scotland, with our big secondary schools, actually all of the variations occurring between different people using exactly the same school resource. And some people are using the school resource and getting fabulous results by any international standards. And other people are using the same resource and falling off a cliff by any international standards. So the point may well be the factors that are shaping outcomes in Scotland are not just or even predominantly the public services, but we should have a statement for ourselves about how we are. Uh, in Virginia, that includes public attitudes data as well. Are Virginians less hateful people than they were, say, 20 years ago? Are their attitudes more progressive, more egalitarian now than they were? And so on. So there's a whole series of things stuck up, and it's just telling the rest of the world, this is what our place is like, here is how we are doing, here are the key trends. I don't think we're sure with a national performance framework, is it a Virginia performs? Or is it actually a performance management tool for public services? I'm not sure we've ever bottomed out on that. Okay. That, that um, tends to indicate is the difficulty of separating out correlation from causation. Yeah. You know, uh, and really, to be honest, at the moment, as, as Colin was saying, the uh, national performance framework it is widely admired, and it does try to measure uh, Scotland in, in a sense as society and uh, you, you know on, on the important fronts. The main thing is, out of that, it's very difficult to say, as, as Colin was indicating, which elements are actually down to uh, public sector performance and which are maybe due to other factors. Uh, I think one of the key things and steps going forwards is probably actually to uh, come back to that idea of a logic map, is to try and establish much more about the what's the actual causation <coughs> rather than just what, you know, is there some correlation. Uh, and I think it's establishing that causation that, that will in the long term lead to uh, the transformation of public services. Um, going back to, I, th I think it was you, Mr Davis, who, who mentioned... Uh, Shetland Islands Council, who was m looking, I don't think you said this, but, it, but in, in light of, of, of reducing budgets and so on, having to prioritise perhaps, uh, as well as it being a good exercise to do. But um, how does that fit just ac across the board with, with single outcome agreements? And, and again, relating that to uh, the community planning partnerships. I mean, is there is there clear understanding, or always, or you know, are there rules followed in terms of of these priorities? I think that what that is is hinging on to to a large extent is actually just how environment aware, if you like, is an organisation that is making changes. Are they considering all the consequences and impacts of their actions? Uh, one point I would say, though, is yes, you know, it's. It's, uh, you know, Shetland is maybe a particular case give, given their uh, level of reserves, but they basically are trying to find st financial stability to protect them going forwards. Financial pressures on other areas as well. Uh, we saw that, uh, as Fraser indicated in Aberdeen, they are driving people to say, or, or organisation to say, well, maybe the incremental budgeting process is not suitable for us now. It may have been in the past in periods of more stability, but when there's significant financial pressure, you probably do have to examine more fundamentally what's happening. But the point about liaison with uh, partners, with CPPs and uh, single outcome agreements, I think with that, it really is a case of have the consequences of any action or inaction of somebody's thinking about, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, changing service provision. Have they been figured through into the service planning and, and how much has that been consideration? You know, because if somebody's just thought our target is to save money, and that's what they're doing, then fine, they may save money, but it might just push another burden onto, the, say, the health service or something, and that's not desirable, really, from a public money point of view. A point on that, I think, again, this question, are we prioritising services when we look at tight budgets, or are we prioritising outcomes? Um, 
uh, you will be aware that all public authorities are now in the middle of a kind of three year planning exercise that in many cases is going to take out very, very substantial sums of money from public budgets. Um, and as say within a council, I think what you tend to do is say, well, education is evidently a priority. It's about children, it's a national priority, and so on. Uh, social care and its relationship with health is clearly a priority. So we kind of prioritise services. Uh, one danger of that is, and I think of things like uh, environmental and land maintenance, these are the parts of councils with absolutely the best track record of creating entry-level employment and then absolutely the best track record of social mobility, that people who come in at entry level are actually advanced through the system and 15 years later are running quite complex uh, public service businesses. Uh, so they didn't come in as graduates at all, they just came in the entry level route. Now, if one of the outcomes every community planning partnership in Scotland has is to create a better flow of entry level employment and get people from unemployment into employment. So if you are prioritising that way, you might actually say, preserving things like land maintenance, facilities management, catering, cleaning, etc. These are areas where we can actually help people in, whereas we will in reality, I suspect, end up prioritising areas that are largely graduate and professional employment and so on, because these are the ones that in service terms are seen to be the highest priority. So there's a really complicated juggling act people need to do here between services and outcomes and public and political expectations around services and outcomes. I was once challenged by a Scottish government minister, write me an outcome-based manifesto. Right? And I tried to do it, and they came out as complete mints. Uh, I wouldn't have voted for it. But it was one of these things where who's not going as a party to want Scotland to be smarter? Who's not going to want it to be healthier? And so on. So once you get it to that level, nobody's disagreeing. Elections then tend to be fought locally and nationally about we'll keep your local school open, we'll make sure there's a classroom pupil-teacher ratio of 26 to 1, whatever, because people get that, and uh, the outcome thing is much harder to turn into attractable politics, I think. So um, my sense is this is really complicated, and some of the judgments you'd make about outcomes if you were prioritising them will be quite different than the typical priority judgments we make about services. Um, I, I might just quickly uh, that... Uh, that is absolutely true in, as, as Colin's examples there, I think, very demonstrate very clearly in councils. It's then even more complicated when you get into community planning because increasingly now, with the exception of the, um, the kind of coterminous places like Fife and Dumfries and Galloway, the council is now virtually the only genuinely local body sitting around that community planning table, uh, with the exception probably the third sector and any private sector <coughs> interest. So health boards, colleges, police, fire are all now regional or national bodies. And there's a really strong tension in there. If you're Greater Glasgow Health Board sitting on eight, or whatever it is, eight-ish uh, community planning partnerships, how, do, how does that health board balance their requirement to deliver their heat targets and to do the thing that they need to do for the whole of Glasgow and also contribute meaningfully to eight single outcome agreements across the very diverse communities that there are in the Greater Glasgow um, uh, and Clyde area? So I think that... Colin's really helpful example of that kind of very prioritising services or outcomes is even more complicated when you get into the community planning partnership arena than it is just in councils. And just finally, um, Colin Mayor, you, you talked uh, at one point about the local communities doing things anyway, kind of, you know, the, how does that measure up? If, we, if, if the national performance framework is the is the pinnacle, is the, the, the tip of the iceberg, I think you called it. Um, are we talking about that, that level of action in local communities? And it seems to me, in, in certainly in the region that I represent, that's where the real progress and action is, and <coughs> exciting work is being done, as people literally decide that they can build houses, that they can uh, uh, run a, a renewable energy scheme, uh, small hydro schemes, small and so on, and, and, and look to earn some money for their own communities. How does that then fit in to the, to, to the all in every sector of the of the way, and the way up to the national performance framework? I think it's built into a lot of the focus on local place now. But if I look at the national performance framework and the literature that goes with it, there was a strong commitment to Scotland having active communities. Uh, and I think 
one of the more exciting developments, certainly across the last five years, from my point of view, is that communities are working in a much more empowered way with public authorities, but some of the time they're just saying we don't need to. Actually, if the public authorities just keep out the way, we can go on and do things for ourselves. So I think it's it feeds into national outcomes. Communities that are active, that feel in control of their lives and feel they can achieve things in them, are also more likely to have better mental health, better economic participation, etc. The one thing I would say is, if you look at the the picture of that type of community activity across Scotland, it is often uneven, and in some of the areas you'd most want to wish to see it, we need to do some work to help those communities organise to feel empowered and to feel they can take control of things. So I think uh, one danger of a model that simply says, uh, hand things over to communities, let them go on with it, is some communities are very well situated to do that just now, and other communities are not, and we need to be careful that there is a proper pattern of support for participation, engagement and empowerment of communities uh, where that's necessary. Thank you. I can maybe just uh, add some uh, a, a thought to that, which is, I think one of the things that maybe reflects is, uh, you know, the focus of an organisation in terms of internal are we very focused on how we provide services? Are we very focused on how you measure services? Or are we, are we actually interested in measuring how our communities are doing and what the impact of what we do actually is? Uh, an example uh, that, that uh, you might take in, in terms of trying to assess you know, what the actual needs are and, and what the outcomes are would be ASCOT, the Adult uh, Social Care Outcomes Toolkit, which is basically designed to say to an individual, how are you doing in these different dimensions? Uh, there might be 10 different dimensions that they're trying to measure to get an idea of what the impact is. And over time, they can come back and they can see the impact of that. And that I would regard as being external because there you're actually getting some feedback from the client, as it were, or the community. If you measure internally and say, well, we saw so many uh, cases in this number of hours, well, that's very internally focused uh, measure. And I think that may be part of, of what's coming forward there as well in terms of are you community focused and what are you trying to measure? Okay, thank you, Jean. Uh, John, to be followed by Michael. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I mean, following on maybe some of the things that have been said already, and I was interested, particularly, Colm Mayor, in, in your kind of example of, you know, the outcomes. But how do you sell that to the electorate? Uh, because um, you know it, it can't be measured very easily, and the, and the electorate is more interested in how many nurses are there in a hospital, or is that hospital still open, or is it still closed? And I mean, I just wonder, listening to all this, I mean, is when we talk about outcomes, is it just so vague and so general that we can all kind of sign up to it, but in practice we need to keep it in the background and focus on inputs and outputs? <laughs> well, no, uh, because I think that would focus us back into our organisations again, and if the public sector historically has been open to accusation, the accusation that it tended to vanish within itself rather than focus on the people it served has probably been one of the most powerful accusations over time. So I think one good thing about an outcome focus is it says the point of what you do is that people's lives are better out there. I think we are getting towards saying, well, in what ways do we want them to be better and what's our likely contribution towards that as public services? It's not a total contribution. So decisions, if they were implemented, that were announced uh, at a party conference yesterday would make some communities in Scotland poorer. Uh, now, you can agree or disagree with that, but it would do that, uh, and that will have some impacts within those communities. So uh, there's other aspects of fiscal policy, macroeconomic, and just global economic pressures that are going to have an impact on Scottish communities as they will in other communities across Europe and elsewhere in the world. So I suppose as long as we don't assume public services create the pattern of outcomes in and of themselves, because they don't, and all the evidence, uh, I think it's a good thing, however, to say, well, uh, you know, if you have a disadvantaged community, if the kids are not attending school, do we just conclude that says something about those kids, or do we ask a much harder question, how are we running a five billion education system in Scotland that's off-putting to maybe 20% of its users? If you were a private business that was off-putting to 20% of your market, you wouldn't be unduly happy about it. So can we run schools in different ways that make them more engaging? And now that would then lead us to look quite hard. When do kids seem to become disengaged? At what point 
of life. It doesn't seem to be at primary, so it seems to be in the transition from secondary. Is that transition well enough managed? Are we offering some children the learning opportunities they actually want as opposed to forcing a standard set of learning opportunities on them, etc. So I think if you start off with the outcome focus and you take it quite seriously, you do ask quite hard questions then that you could evade asking if we just do this inputs, outputs. Should be taking that outcomes based? I mean, is it just at the parliament level? Should the council be doing that? Should the head teacher be doing that? The whole way through, for me. I mean, and I do think actually the more local you get, the more genuinely people both get and are committed to outcomes. They're real for them. They're about people they mix with day in, day out. They're not abstractions. They're not performance measures. They are real people you're encountering in your day-to-day -day work, whether it's in education, social care, or whatever. So, uh, in a way, I think the local probably, in many ways, gets it better but talks about it less. Uh, and the national gets it less well but talks about it a hell of a lot. Um, and you know That's maybe the way you'd want it because what happens locally will most materially impact on the quality of people's lives, the quality of opportunity they get. So for me, and the outcome thing is not about just political accountability. It is actually about managing services in new and different ways and working with communities in new and different ways. And if anything, I think that's more important, frankly, than the political accountability bit of this. Um, that people are empowered and are very focused. And I do think there is a real change taking place. Uh, we would very prematurely abandon an outcome focus if we abandon it now. I think it's actually growing legs at the present moment and is beginning to motor if that's not a completely mangled metaphor for which I apologise instantly. Uh, but I do think we often abandon things in the public service just when they're about to pay off. Well, I, uh, I do totally agree with that, yes. I mean, can I just press you on this? I mean, how, I'm, I'm just thinking of a head teacher. I have a head teacher say to me in one of my local schools, it's like having two separate schools, which yep. ties in with, I think, what you yep. were saying earlier, that the same resources can produce quite different results. I'm just wondering, you know... I mean, both the council and ourselves then are wanting to measure that school, we're wanting to look at higher results, we're wanting to look at, you know, all sorts of things. All the freedom the head teacher seems to have to me is exactly how many periods, no, they've, they've, I think that's decided how many periods they have, but they can actually move them around a bit within the week. I mean, should we therefore be giving, if we push more freedom and decision making down to that level and ask them to take an outcomes based approach, does that not become impossibly hard to measure for everybody else? Well, for some kids, I think you will properly measure their educational progress and the progress they want by standard grades or N5s and hires and advanced hires and so on. For other kids, and this is about how empowered leadership at school level is able to be, should we be offering vocational qualifications from secondary two onwards if that's what kids want to do? What's our problem with that? So you have to do Spanish but you can't do karmic. I, I absolutely fail to comprehend why that would be a sensible judgment to make if part of the school wants that sort of opportunity. Now, if we valued those things up, I don't think you'd find head teachers would want to stand in the way of developments of that sort. Um, but I think just now what we're saying is you almost have to go through the whole of four years and then you can escape to the vocational education you always wanted. That does not fit with what Parliament and Government have said about their commitments to vocational education has got to be. So, in a way, I would hope head teachers would be looking. If I feel I've got two schools, if I'm only catering for one of them, then I'm failing. And I have a duty to look at how I cater then for the other school that I've got here and make sure that our educational offerings are actually attractive and positive from the point of view of the whole range of pupils I have attending this school. But I think you're right, we're very locked into a certain way of thinking about educational performance mm -hmm. and that gets imposed downwards on people. I would prefer greater empowerment to actually tailor the education to suit the kid. That's what from Curriculum for Excellence says, philosophically speaking, mm -hmm. we now have to deliver that in practice. This will be an education fitted to the child, not the child being fitted to an education we already decided upon. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr Davis, you, you used the word awareness, I think, earlier on and that suggested to me that as long as the, all the, like the schools and all the other organisations were aware of the outcomes, the national outcomes, that, that, that would be kind of enough. I mean, is, is that enough or do, do we need to pin them down more? A, a difficult question to answer in, in many respects. Um, if we go back to uh, previous uh, submission uh, roundabout government, 
There's a recognition that there may be differences between the national uh, priorities and national level of service that, that people want to see across Scotland as a bare minimum and maybe local variations in that. I think what we've suggested before is effectively that you know, if there's going to be local variation, then there should be a clear reason for that variation and it should be justifiable and people should be able to come back and justify to central government, for instance, like, uh, for instance, you know, why that variation has occurred and why it's appropriate for the, for the locality. Um, I certainly take from your initial question, you know, the outcomes are always going to be, I think, seen as a bit nebulous. There's always going to be that quality aspect to it, which somebody's going to turn around and say, you can't always measure that. Uh, so I think it's the balance between, uh, you know, it's like the awareness and to a certain extent of, you know, you know uh, the, the analogy to, to motoring was used earlier, who's driving? Uh, I mean, when somebody's driving a car, they generally speak now looking out and they're not looking at the dashboard all the time. So, you know, that may be a weak analogy, but actually, to be honest, you know, that, that's, you, you know, strikes me as having a bit of truth to it. And the question is, to what extent do you want people to be driving what's happening locally, mm -hmm. is, is maybe the question. Yeah, I mean, I think you also mentioned that, that, that you know, except that the, the, the causation was difficult between the linkage between spending and outcomes. And I mean, this has mm -hmm. come up, certainly in all the budgets that have been here since 2011, you know, can we link the actual spending, which I guess is looking at the dashboard, yeah. with the outcome as to mm -hmm. what's out there, the bigger picture. I mean, do we just have to accept that these are pretty loose a lot of the time? I think Nirvana would be, we would have perfect information and perfectly be able to measure uh, outcomes in a way that, let us say, you know, that's what we've got. I think the best that we'll get, certainly in the short term, is proxy measures. And for me, it's all about challenging how good is that proxy measure, you know. Uh, and really, to be honest, there is, I suspect, going to be that gap. But it's narrowing that gap that's the, the, the important thing. I'm, that mean, I'm, I'm interested in the phrase proxy measures. That came up in somewhere else as well, I think, with, with the schools. I mean... Because is it inevitable an organisation like a school or a hospital will then start bending their performance to meet the proxy measure rather than the outcome, and we therefore need to keep changing the proxy measures to kind of pin them down? That, that has certainly been suggested in, in one publication that's in draft uh, from CITFA. They're actually, you know, the, the company's actually made that some organisations have actually changed the output measures, partly as they go as they respond to seeing what causation is, and partly to, to prevent an overly output focused or, or output measure focus, you know, that actually detracts from what you're trying to achieve. So I, I think trying to say to people, yeah, the output measures that you've got, um, you know, are, are not the be all and end all of what you're doing because that can drive distorted behavior, either innocent distorted behavior or, or, or sometimes actually underhand, if you like, uh, as distorted behavior in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, there was an uh, example in England where uh, in order to uh, uh, reduce waiting times and to get people into what they called beds, they took the wheels off all the trolleys and said, that's a bed. You know, <laughs> that does not... <laughs> that, that, that doesn't exactly seem to be going in the right direction, but that's an example of being output measure focused rather than outcomes you know, focused. And, and I think that's the example. Okay. Mr McKinley, did you want to say something? And I've got another question. It strikes me as a good example of innovative thinking that we should probably um, try and harness. I think there's... So to, to come to your original question, Mr Mason, I think, from we, I think one of the things we've found is that when people talk about the outcomes approach, the, kind of, the mindset is, therefore, it doesn't matter what we do to get there. And that's a, that's a challenge that I've heard repeatedly from, from people in councils and in health boards and other places about the end result is all and therefore why, why are we, the auditors, interested in the inputs and the outputs? Well, we're always going to be because the outcomes approach is about all of those things. Um, and you can't only look at the outcomes without thinking about the inputs and the outputs and the activity that's actually driving the outcomes. So for me, it's about um, having that overall whole system view of the world. And this is going to sound a bit kind of flippant and, and trite and I apologise for that but it is a mindset thing so to continue the school example we're not suggesting I don't think anyone's suggesting that a community planning partnership is going to take over the running of a school but I think what is what is reasonable and legitimate is that everyone in those, everyone that's working in that school thinks about their job in terms of outcomes so if you work in a school canteen your job isn't just to hand over the food to the kids as they come through and get their lunch every day they, you have a different kind of outlook about how does, how does that wee Johnny look today? 
has he been here for a couple of days? You know, there's a kind of there's a wider approach, a wider mindset, I think, for everyone in public services that means you still need to deliver the service to come to Colin's point, but you're doing that in the context of um, a wider set of outcomes and what we're all ultimately trying to achieve. So, um, so that's where I would see the the kind of real. It's that kind of cultural thing, and and the measurement thing is really tough. It's something that we're grappling with. How do you audit some of this stuff? How do you audit a culture of outcomes and good partnership working? It's not as straightforward as it as it used to be. But I think we need to find the measures that that capture those kind of softer cultural aspects, which are actually the things that are going to make the difference to people's lives. I reckon. And and if that's a challenge for you as the auditors, it's it's also a challenge for us, absolutely, both as the finance committee and as the whole parliament, yep. as to how do we kind of oversee this all of this and make any kind of measurements because it's very easy to say well there's a waiting list of x um, and we all do that kind of thing but um it's much harder to have you got an answer for us then i, th I think the scrutiny that that we apply and obviously we uh, report to parliament and i think the job for the parliamentary committees is in a sense to be challenging the people that are running the place to figure that out themselves partly I mean, I think the, the bit the bit that we all struggle with is what are the measures in the first place that's really going to help us do this stuff. And that's not my job. It's not necessarily a, your job in the committee. That's the people who are running the system's job to figure out what the sensible and and nuanced and you know sophisticated measurement approaches that we, we that we can that we can develop. And there are examples out there, and we're seeing it in some in some places. And I think uh, the work that this committee has been doing, I think, will continue to. Uh, apply that scrutiny and it is striking that when you look at the budget papers there's lots of good stuff in there and there's lots of detail and lots of it is pretty transparent and the numbers bit remains almost entirely disconnected from the activity and outcome bit okay when you look at those papers i mean the other area i just want to ask you about which you've mentioned already was community planning partnerships now i mean i remain pretty skeptical about them as to whether they really are just talking shops sure and the police and everybody else turns up and they talk about a theme but they just go away and do whatever they're going to do anyway with a little bit of cake icing, as I think uh, Mr Mayor said earlier. And, I mean, the, the, the councils, I mean, if people understand a council. They elect a councillor. Something goes wrong with the roads. They go to their councillor, shout at them, whatever, and, and, and maybe get sorted. Community planning partnerships, I think, are just such vague animals. Um, and who, who are they accountable to? Well, the council bit we still understand because they've got an input. But, I mean... You know, the health secretary cannot oversee the input of 32 bits of the health service and assess, as far as I'm concerned, are they having good local input in Clackmannanshire and in Glasgow and in Orkney and all these places? Can they? Well, to be fair to the Scottish Government, they've been pretty clear that the, the Scottish Government bits, so including health and indeed all the agencies, and inter, uh, like the enterprise agencies and SNH and others, they have been pretty clear that all those organisations uh, will contribute meaningfully to community planning and that's part of for example in health boards the local delivery plans and that's all part of that accountability process so the way that the system is designed to work is um, as well as in the, within the partnership people holding each other to account the individual bodies will themselves be held to account for the contribution to the partnerships now that's the theory Mr Mason so I, and, and on this point I think we probably agree is that I don't think we're there yet. I mean, we, we saw some examples in, in, the, in the CPP audits not that long ago where the health board just weren't even turning up half the time to the community planning partnership. So that's the point I was making earlier on, which is what is the accountability mechanism for that and for partnership? Something, something needs to happen to make that better. Just one remark there. I think, in a way... <coughs> CPPs have evolved over some period of time. They're by no means, I think, the finished article from MD at this end of the table's point of view. However, they are progressing, and I think what everybody's agreed is we need something that pulls together across public agencies a common focus on outcomes at local level. So if you don't call it a CPP, and I don't really care what you would call it, but if nothing's there, then we are back in our boxes, doing our own thing, down our service lines and so on. So it would seem to me a shame to lose what's actually been a genuine progression across the last period, where I think in the base partnerships, they are now quite hard-nosed. They have a very small number of priorities. They are very clear how they're going to achieve them and so on. And we need to capture some of that practice and roll it out around the system, I think, rather than... Uh, doing community planning partnerships just now. 
I think there may have been a talking phase uh, in Queen's Planning, but frankly, to create a basis of trust when you could then do anything. Now, that may seem a bit luxurious in retrospect, but I think there was a necessary period where mm. people did actually get together and talk in a more flexible way so they could get then uh, to planning together. So I, I'm actually possibly more positive I think there is a lot more clarity in the community planning partnerships around Scotland. I think their meetings are much more purposeful. I think this year there will be a lot of emphasis on sharing information about how we're using resources and what impacts these may have on outcomes and on different services, etc. So I actually think we are getting somewhere with them at the present moment. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Davis, yes. Uh, I was just going to add very briefly, I can't uh, necessarily talk so much about CPPs, but where there's uh, structure and incentives to cooperate, um, I think that cooperation can happen between bodies. And I'm thinking particularly of the uh, Clyde Valley City deal, you know, where, as I understand it, there's a lot of effort went in to pulling that together to agree the governance structures and arrangements and actually move ahead with it fairly quickly. So, you know, that's an example where different organisations, you, you know, uh, are covering one geographical area, can actually uh, pull together and work together. And I think the, the challenge is, therefore, for the CPPs, really, how do we get a structure that achieves that same objective? Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, to be followed by Gavin.